This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with performance analyst Carlon Carpenter. He discusses his work at Statsbomb and how this can inform key decisions at clubs, his process as an analyst, and how an MDT team can be best utilised, as well as the future trend of statistics in football. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So, Carlon, listen, really appreciate you spending a bit of your time with me. How are things your end? Are you all good? Yeah, they're great. You know, uh, work's been good. You know, football season's back and running, so that's always an exciting time, obviously. A busy time for uh, for everyone at Statsbomb and as well, helping out my, myself with Bass City. So, uh, it's been it's been good, yeah. Perfect. So, as you said there, Bath City, which is, is local to, to me, which is nice to, mm-hmm. I do a lot of these with people all over the place. So having someone who's half an hour from me is, is always nice. For people that maybe don't know you or, or, or don't know your role, do you just want to explain kind of what your roles are and what that entails from kind of a day to day basis? Yeah, so at Bath City, my, my job is a performance analyst, which is um, essentially I do most of the, uh, I do all the opposition pre-match scouting, uh, the post-match analysis from, uh, I provide the feedback from a tactical and as well a data standpoint as well the day after a game. Um, and that's also involving with throughout the week as well, um, providing players with data, you know, uh, tactical feedback on coaching and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so a pretty comprehensive sort of support staff role, which allows the, the coaching staff to kind of worry about, you know, implementing everything on the pitch. Um, and I provide them feedback, which kind of suits and uh, provides uh, some context to a lot of the stuff. Um, and that's my that's my role at Bass City. Um, my my day to day job with Statsbomb is is a lot more fluid. Uh, the title I have at, at Statsbomb is a tactical and video analyst. Um, so if anyone doesn't have any kind of real understanding of what uh, Statsbomb is, we are a a data provider, a football data provider, uh, sort of like Opta, uh, who are, are kind of our main competitors. Um, so I, I joined in October 2020 with my background in performance analysis. And my job is to basically help uh, the data side of our of our company kind of connect with the client side. So connecting the, the data and make it, uh, making it something which can be uh, contextualized by my coaching staff or analysts. Um, and obviously that's primarily the medium I work in is, is video. Um, so basically if we have a, you know, a group, a, a group, a data set, and I basically tell our clients, like, this is how this metric kind of plays out. And this is what it looks like on the pitch. So kind of helping them kind of mesh the two together uh, is my primarily role at Stats Bomb. And as well as a, there's a side component, which is uh, a consulting element, which is basically uh, clubs come to us and I do, opposition analysis, player analysis, et cetera, for them. So uh, I wear a lot of different hats, but it's basically kind of all within the context of analysis and football. Perfect. So we'll dig a little bit deeper on some of that because I think it'd be interesting to see how you work um, and I guess tailor in and bespoke models or whatnot to different people because everyone's going to want to want different different data sets, et cetera. But I guess the first point is why football? What drew you to football in, in its first place? Yeah, so um, I think kind of the original starting point was everyone in the U.S., regardless of how long you actually stay in the sport, um, because of the fact that, you know, all the other competitive American sports are a little bit uh, like American football, for example, baseball requires a lot more of the equipment kind of side of things. Everyone at a certain age basically plays football uh, when you're about five years old till about 10. Everyone is playing, uh, you know, recreational football Um um, I kind of had a little bit more of a, a kicking towards that because my my mom is Austrian and my dad has always been interested in football. Um, so they kind of pushed me down that path more long term. Um, so that was always my background. And, and, and I played up until uh, I played up until a, a pretty high level. I played college football over in the U.S. at Division One, which is like the highest kind of amateur level. Uh, and then I was involved with uh, some USL uh, clubs, which are basically the second division in uh, under MLS. There's the USL. I was involved with some of their 
reserve team kind of playing there. Um, and so I've always just football is regardless of whether I've been watching it or playing, it has always been pretty, a, a pretty important part of my life. And so <clears throat> when you came to the point of obviously stop playing and looking to still be involved in some, co- some capacity, what drew you towards the, I guess, performance analysis side, the video data type of work? Yeah, uh, I think kind of, even when I was playing, um, I was obviously, I, I, I don't, like to big up myself that much but i was i was a pretty good player but i was much more of a person who would like to more of a thinker of the kind of game like i was my 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 mind was a lot more bit capable of doing what i wanted to do than my body a lot of the time um uh, i was a goalkeeper so that basically meant not letting in shots uh but i had always been kind of interested in like watching the game and kind of a deeper level than rather than just oh this is you know a sport i like to watch it's just fun i, I kind of like to look at it like what are the tactics teams are using why is this why is this one team so successful outside of them having really good players um so when i was kind of thinking of, of transitioning uh i actually did a um my, my degree was actually in history so i didn't really think that it was going to be something that I could do it was a career basically i had always been kind of playing around with video analysis software always kind of writing just for fun just kind of like match reports and analysis reports just even when i was playing in college um and so the, the opportunity kind of came up because i had a friend who was the um performance analyst at the university of virginia uh men's college team one of the top programs in the u.s he was leaving to become the where he still is the performance analyst for the is the national team in the United States. There's no real kind of analysis courses in uh, the United States, unlike here in England, uh, which I'm really jealous about. Um, but I basically was all self-taught. And he basically said, this is a great entry point. If you want to, if you're really interested in this, you can, I'll, I'll recommend you. Um, so yeah, I, I, re- I was very local. I basically lived about a block away from the team I would eventually work for. Um, and I luckily I was get, get the job and that was kind of my first role. And that was in uh, 2018. Okay, so obviously you're in, in that role and stuff. And then what, what did that entail from a day-to-day basis? So what type of roles you're undertaking? How were you supporting, I guess, the coach and staff and their delivery? Yeah, so... Um, what kind of when I came in, it was very different to what I, I thought because I, I I was aware of what a perform a performance analyst did did, but I basically thought it would be I would come in there and have a much more kind of like I have I I have my way of playing. This is how I want us to play, so I'm going to provide feedback. And that was basically, and I realized that's a terrible way to go about performance analysts. Your job is basically they're you're a part of a support staff for a reason. Is you're there to kind of back up and help the coaching staff. So. I came in basically in my, my job day to day was um, doing opposition analysis reports, uh, post-match stuff, filming training, um, helping out with recruiting, which was very important, obviously, for the college game and basically providing video feedback for that, uh, interactive data dashboard. So basically what I do day to day at Bass City, um, but at kind of at a different kind of level, because I was I was also with Bass City, obviously, it's um it's obviously I do it as a kind of a part-time thing because I'm full-time with stats bomb, but with UVA, it was basically like every day I would go and training, uh, 8 AM film training, get it uploaded, break it down with the coaching staff and do all that kind of stuff. So it was very much my job was to kind of do what I do at Bass City now, but uh, at a, at a more comprehensive kind of level. And you mentioned there about the necessity to kind of shape the provision to the coach. Yeah. Can you talk about, I guess, some examples of people that you've worked with maybe that have wanted it in a specific way and how you've gone around doing that? Yeah. So I've been, I've been lucky. I've worked, uh, so I worked for UVA for four years or sorry, for, for three years, uh, the U S men's youth national teams for two years, uh, Jerry here at Bath city for two. And then obviously other various kind of side projects I've done. Um, and I've been lucky that every single coach has not basically been like a, you know, just like sit deep and pump it into the channel thing, which would be obviously I, I, I like different styles of play and all these coaches I've worked for have different styles of play. Um, but they've all been very upfront about being kind of on the front foot, you know, pressing, playing kind of that, you know, the style of play that people like to watch. But what I kind of have to do and what every analyst should do when they go into a club is basically sit down with the coaching staff and being like, okay, what do you want out of the reports? Because when you get education from performance analysts, courses, et cetera, 
they teach you how to do everything. Like they teach you how to use video analysis. They teach you how to put together a report, et cetera. Um, but they don't really help you out in kind of that practical skill of tailoring because there's a, there's limitless amounts of information you can provide. And, uh, you know, it's paralysis by analysis. It's very easy to present too much information. Um, and a lot of it doesn't really necessarily matter. Um, so if I was, for example, um, I'll just use kind of an example that most of your listeners will probably know is if I was working for Sean Dyche when he was at Burnley, I wouldn't probably show him a lot of clips of areas where the, you know, where we could present potentially high press the opposition, because that's just not necessarily something we did. We would press, obviously, but it'd be at a lower block. So making sure that I tailor my information for most importantly, who I'm actually, co the coaches want, um, and then obviously for the opposition, because if I'm providing information which is tailored and kind of, you know, digestible for them, it makes that transition from actually them putting it and coaching it on the on the training pitch much, much easier than it would be if I was to, to kind of just prevent like an all encompassing kind of this is how they play kind of thing. So, yeah, and in terms of a, a video point of view, how much time do you spend during the week actually showing clips either of your team or the opposition team to the coach and staff that you're working yeah with. um that that was kind of a thing i learned because i basically when i would put together a video uh my when i first started a full-time doing performance analysis i would basically kind of put together your very typical video presentation which would be like 45 minutes of clips which you know it gets a bad rap players falling asleep etc like in a darkened room it doesn't really help um what i normally do um and this is kind of an ideal scenario and it's something that's worked for me over time is making sure that you provide probably about five minutes of clips before every single training session throughout the week for every week for every session you do so it's small enough that you know you're going to catch the attention of them but it's also something that's fairly consistent so video analysis is something that they're used to um and then obviously right the day before a game uh you would provide a little bit more of a longer kind of a, a longer one because those are obviously have their benefits um, but what I would do with those kind of smaller things would be, it would be clips that were prep, uh, that were relevant to that session. So if we were doing a session on kind of our buildup patterns, for example, I was making sure that I would show five minutes of buildup. And so basically showing why we're going to be doing this stuff in training and how we're going to do it kind of in a video example. So they see it and they're aware of it. And then when it goes to the training pitch, they're actually able to, to kind of put that together. And how does that change if it's a known um, a known pattern or known body of work compared as if it's new? So if I look at the example, you know, inverted fullbacks have become yeah. quite common now, whereas, you know, a few years ago when Man City were doing it and Gail Cleese was doing it for Pep, everyone was like, well, what is he doing? Why is he playing yeah. people in there? But now that's kind of a known. So how does that change in terms of what you're preparing from a group that maybe knows that body of work that's being done, but they, they're revisiting it because they need to make sure it's ready for the weekend compared to a new concept, which you're yeah. trying to develop or learn because this is the steer that they're going to be going towards in the future. Yeah. So one thing obviously is just, you can obviously tailor the amount of video you're doing. So if it's something that's very, you know, kind of new to them and you're, you're basically like you played this one season in a four, three, three, and then you're going to switch to a three, five, two. Um, hopefully the preseason and kind of like the early weeks are implementing that you're going to have to do a little bit more video because that's obviously necessary for them to kind of see it or, uh, you know, put it in the training pitch. Um, but I also, what I like to do is kind of to kind of take that complexity away because if, for example, taking your inverted fullbacks kind of thing, if I was working with the staff who wanted to put that into the pitch and like, I basically explain that to the players, like we're going to play with this. They'd be like, okay, well, I really don't really like, I'm not really sure what that means. I would show them an example of a team or a, a team or like, you know, something they would know. I'd be like, okay, well, we're going to watch Man City. You all watch Man City before you, you know, the Premier League's everywhere. So we're going to watch clips of Man City doing it. So you know exactly when you're watching games and you're kind of aware to kind of give them that kind of touch the point of rather than just, you know, us kind of doing it on the training pitch, showing a real world examples. And I do that with individual players as well is like, I basically look at if I'm working with, uh, for example, one of the players I worked with uh, um, at UVA was Daryl DK, who just uh, he's at West Bromwich Albion now. Um, and I would show him clips of players that we were, were similar to him at a top level to basically be like, OK, well, 
it's very easy for us to kind of coach this stuff to you and like you see it on the pitch, but we're going to show you a real world example. So you can kind of make that, that uh, sort of that conversion period a little bit less. So. And how do you manage the like, yeah, lack of a better thing, the levels to it? So it's very yeah. easy to go, you know, I'm going to show you an Mbappe or I'm going to show you a yeah. De Bruyne and them doing it. But there's probably a reason why De Bruyne and Mbappe are on £200,000 a week yeah. and the players that you're working with aren't on that or are trying to get to that at yeah. this moment in time. So how do you manage, I guess, the expectation of what we want to achieve compared to the reality of where we are right now in our journey? Yeah, and I think I think most of that is kind of in... I kind of say this is like the best analysts are not the ones who are just necessarily the ones which have all the technical skills. It's the ones who can kind of provide information in a way which is palatable. And a lot of that is basically, you know, having that kind of human bond and your presenting your pre presentation techniques of basically saying like, we don't, we're not necessarily expecting you to have the outcomes of Mbappe when you're playing, or, you know, we don't expect you to be turned into Virgil van Dyke just because we're coaching you similar to Virgil van Dyke. Like the outputs might be different. But how you kind of move, what you're kind of seeing and like what kind of movements you're making, et cetera, are all very important. And they're all kind of translatable. Like you're not going to necessarily win like Virgil van Dijk. You're not going to necessarily win, you know, 75% of your headers or your, your, your clearances. But if you're putting yourself consistently into those positions, more likely than not, you're going to be succeed. And obviously we would tailor it because we're not going to ask, you know, a seven foot tall center forward to be like, Hey, watch Mbappe and just run and run the channels like him. So it's a little bit of, it's just kind of like knowing, knowing your audience as well as knowing the player. So. And for you uh, currently, what does your, I guess, match week look like? So on the assumption you're playing at three o'clock on a Saturday and I know, yeah. you know, at the moment you probably have midweekers and stuff as well, but let's assume that you've got a full working week with yeah. the guys I know that obviously we'll have other jobs and stuff. What would the actual working week look like for you? And then what do you actually present to coaches, to players? And how does that look throughout the week? Yeah, so I might, I, I'm going to add a little bit of creative license here because Bath, we only are able to train two times a week, which is obviously not ideal for coaching or presentation. But say I was given a full kind of week of training. Um, so after the match on Saturday, usually at three o'clock ends at 5.30. Um, I have done live codings on, through uh, video analysis software uh, to make sure that I kind of have all my team clips uh, done. But also that night, I watch it back twice again, just so I have a little bit more, you know, fine-tuned kind of concept stuff um, rather than just sort of like phase of play stuff. So I, I make sure that's all clipped up and then uploaded so the players can watch it, the coaching staff can watch it. Um, and then on that Sunday, I'm basically already starting for the next Saturday. Um, so there's obviously we're given match video. I like to watch back the last three matches of the opposition. Um, sometimes ideally five, but video in uh, available in video in the National League South isn't necessarily uh, the most timely uh, or the greatest quality. So three, I usually watch. Um, and then by then, pretty much the Monday, I've basically done the kind of the bulk of the report of you know, how we're going to play, uh, you know, this is what they're put together. So I put together a report with video to get, add context to that. Uh, Tuesday is kind of like the first session because uh, Sunday is obviously off. Monday is kind of a light kind of recovery day. Tuesday is kind of the first session where we have all the group together. Uh, and that's basically that Tuesday analysis session prior to training is more of a recap for the last uh, for the last meet, match uh, and kind of being like, this is what we did well. And now this is what we're going to kind of move forward into Tuesday and building off what we did well and what we did negatively kind of in the context of the opposition. Uh, so, for example, um, last week, say we played Ebsleet on Saturday. We won. We did pretty well, but we didn't do a good job of our, our pressing patterns. I'll kind of highlight that and be like, well, this is why the pressing patterns now will be important because on the weekend we're playing Braintree and they're going to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that goes on Wednesday as well, a little bit more video, um, a little bit less video kind of on that. Uh, and then Thursday is a little bit more uh, of the kind of, kind of what I was talking about earlier about kind of like the contextual stuff. So if we're looking to work on our buildup patterns, Thursday, I'll add some video on some buildup and then we'll implement them in training. Friday, and it's kind of a staple of most analysts, is the Friday is uh, the longer form video kind of report. 
Um, and as well, I'll also throw in uh, a lot of set piece stuff. Uh, set Friday, because obviously it's going to be a lighter session. It'll be a little bit more potentially uh, the coaching staff will put in shadow play, set pieces, stuff that will kind of, you know, get them moving, but not necessarily kill them. So I can get a little, I can do a little bit more creative license in terms of what I do with the analysis, because that will probably be a little bit longer than the five kind of 10 minutes and it'll probably be like 20 minutes of video. Um, and then Saturday as well, while it's obviously, you know, that's match day, there's obviously not much you can do there. Um, I always put together a little kind of when the team actually meet prior to going out and warming up, I always put together a little kind of a recap thing. Nothing, I won't throw huge amounts of information at them that are that they haven't seen before, unless like they show up and like, you know, their entire starting 11 isn't there. Like I'll probably put together something like we'll throw everything out the window. That's not going to do it. Um, it's more recapping principles. So, um, and those are usually ones which don't like chain. Like we want to play how we play, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's a pretty consistent, like those kind of match weeks, luckily, where it's basically Saturday to Saturday or few and far between. Uh, last season, we actually had a lot in the National League South. Uh, there wasn't so many Tuesday match weeks, but now they're they're back. And uh, so your turnaround time in terms of your video and your analysis has to be a lot tighter. So, Yeah, I guess that comes into my next question is how, how much effect can you have in, in a video perspective to a getting the players to adapt to what's coming ahead of them. Yeah. So obviously, like you've mentioned there, you might say you've got Braintree on, on the Tuesday night, for example, that might play a 4-3-3 in, yeah. a, in a low block and their striker cheats and look for spacing behind and they do that. And then you might be playing Ebsfleet the following week and Ebsfleet play a 3-5-2, very ball orientated and like look to retain the possession at all costs. How much are you able to affect the the patterns of the players or the you know the the particular types of presses and whatnot they're doing in that time using that footage? Yeah, so a lot of it, um, it it obviously kind of depends on the coach. Like, there's obviously some coaches who really like to tailor to the opposition. Um, but ultimately, my kind of opinion is like, if you're playing one way, you're not going to be able to change much in terms of like fundamentally how you play if you're if you're looking to kind of make a huge system change it's something that's going to take a couple of weeks um so what we kind of what i do in the video is kind of like if like you said if there's two kind of distinct styles of play i kind of make sure that we you know our principles of play are going to remain the same so i show videos of those principles staying the same but having slight if, if it, even if it's like a formational shift like for example uh i think that we can exploit when we're pressing against a team who play uh, a four two three one. I think we can really exploit that kind of the pit, uh, the number tens kind of position by playing a double pivot rather rather than playing with one uh, pivot. I'll kind of show a video that kind of show that. So like not making huge fundamental sweeping changes through the video, but kind of showing up like you know we're going to still look to play how we play, but it's just going to be slightly tweaked. And this, these are examples of why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Um, if I was going to do kind of like the coaching staff and us sit down, we went down, went down a run of, you know, losing five straight matches and we were terrible in our kind of style of play. That would be kind of a, take a longer term sort of like, this just needs to be a complete write up in terms of a new shape. And that would obviously be a very different scenario, obviously, because you're, you're still dealing, you're still dealing with matches throughout the week. Um, so that would be a little bit more of a longer form sort of thing. And I guess when when you're watching, how much are you able to um, analyze points of strength or points of weakness with the other team that might be related to either a shape or principle, yeah. but equally maybe an individual um, that particularly stands out and you're going to say to the coach and staff, listen, we need to do something about him because he is an issue or actually yeah. this person's a real liability on the ball if we press in this scenario we might be able to re regain the ball slightly easier. Yeah. So I think the kind of the one thing I do when I, when I watch a game from the opposition, I obviously look at kind of the overall structures of the team uh, first. And that's kind of like the main starting point, like how they play both with and without the ball. And obviously within football, that kind of relates to like, so they're a team which likes to play through the thirds 
which are the players which enable them to do that. So kind of like within that kind of team structure, what allows them to actually do that? Because like it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like you you can't you can't look at the kind of overall structure of how a team plays and then just kind of be like, well, this is the structure. If you, if you, if you kind of like look at the overall structure and then kind of narrow in like, okay, they're great at, you know, playing, you know, say if I was playing Leicester City and like their title winning campaigns, like really direct 4-4-2, blah, blah, blah. Like what allows them to do so? Well, if we don't put pressure on Danny Drinkwater, he's going to be able to get his head up and Jamie Vardy is going to, you know, put it in behind. So kind of like identifying those key overall strengths and then narrowing it down is, is kind of what I like to do it. Um, and then obviously like same sort of stuff of like uh, for w- without the ball is a little bit different because like, obviously they're not playing us those weeks, but one way you can kind of like narrow that gap between the information, which is relevant is by looking at a team, which plays similar to us. So if, if we're like, if they're playing a team, which like us is playing a four, three, three, who likes to high press, I'll look at them and being like, okay, well, what, what, what did that team that plays like us do well against them? And how were they able to do that? And so similar way, once you look at that overall focus, you can narrow it down and see, okay, well, the right back stinks if you apply pressure to the ball, et cetera. So, so do you collect or collate like a database of the teams in your league and maybe what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, or which how they play and stuff like that, so that you've got that to hand to be able to use it as you need to? Yeah. So um every time we play, um, so through stats bomb basically we actually collect all the data in the league so i kind of have a, a data side of things kind of pre-done for me which is really really nice um but as well for the video side of things there's a kind of a league exchange for video um so i basically have every access to you know all the teams matches that have played um and throughout the kind of the thing i'll obviously have a you know an understanding you play a team twice a season so I'll kind of have that kind of information to relic. And I make sure I database every single video thing. I, I clip every single thing of uh, every single post-match report, every single set piece, uh, attacking set piece routine that the opposition have done just so it's easily on hand. So when I'm like watching for playing, I played absolute like in September and then April, I go look at them. I have that kind of like that free, that data I've kind of looked back on and be like, okay, well, I'm going to do a refresher and take a look at this and say, okay, well, this is how they played in September. And then when I do that kind of report of watching their three most recent games, I can say, well, they've changed slightly and adapted to this. Um, so it's making sure that just every single video thing I have and resource I have is kind of updated in terms of like how they play. So I suppose, as you said, using that, um, statistical piece to begin with is quite a good point because you can see you know number of high regains or yeah. number of passes yeah. through the thirds so it yeah. allows you to pigeonhole them I guess slightly earlier before you look at them. yeah and that's some people have different ways like some people like to look at the the tactical side of things first and then say like okay well they did this let's see how how successful that was and kind of contextualize that I like to just look at the kind of the data first and then go into the video from there, just so I kind of have a, I mean, not to big up stats bomb, but we have pretty good data in terms of like, what is it, what is collected, the quality of data. So I know it's going to be accurate. So if I look at a team and be like, okay, well, this team is the highest pressure per defensive action in the league. So obviously I know when I watch them, I should highlight, you know, they look depressed. Uh, you know, they have the most shots created from from counter from counterattacks. I know what to highlight and that's what I can do. So it kind of gives me an ability to kind of like not completely like narrow my focus and put on blinders because obviously I'll, I'll watch the game with with the kind of information I know I want out of it. But at the same time, I'll basically be knowing that this is going to be something I'm going to see a lot. So I have to be ready to provide that information. Yeah, so I think it comes nicely onto what is your your process if you are looking at an opposition report. So how do you avoid things like confirmation bias or yeah. you know getting drawn into areas like you discussed there? So you know if if you were saying, for example, you're you're playing Eastly this weekend and yeah. you're going to look through those three fixtures, what is your process as you go through these three fixtures to narrow it down to then understand the content you're then going to transfer to the staff and players? Yeah, so um. One thing I do is I don't actually there's a, there's like a, a decent amount of kind of collaboration in terms of uh, certain people like to kind of like ask analysts they know and be like, OK, well, what do you see from them? 
I don't really like to do that because like every coach and analyst kind of looks at the game differently. So I kind of like to go with a fresh, a fresh kind of like, don't tell me how they played. I'll watch it myself and kind of provide the information there. Um, and I kind of break it down. Basically my reports are kind of like, there's, there's been a lot of talk about like, Oh, there's, there's, there's no real settled phases like that whole kind of like in possession, out possession, transition, all that kind of stuff. I think it's just easier for the players to kind of look at information in that way. So when I'm presenting information, I look at reports. My kind of starting point is looking up how they build up, how they play in the middle of the third, how they play in the final third, and then like transitional attacks, and then kind of flip flopping it the other way. Like how do they high press? How do they sit in a mid and low block? And then like how do they uh, how do they look to transition as well? And then obviously set pieces. So kind of like narrowing it down, watching back as many matches as I can, providing clips of that, and kind of coding it first. So I have like the three matches to kind of collect data or sorry, collect video of, and then basically look at it and be like, okay, well, now I'm going to look at all those video clips I've made of them in them building up play and being like providing a kind of a, a template of that. Okay, this is how I'm going to, uh, this is how they build up. Provided that information through, you know, you can do it through, through I like to do it through, you know, uh, just a pretty simple, you know, slideshow, a presentation, like a, you know, keynote or PowerPoint, whatever. Uh, provide that, provide that information in kind of a text format so they can read it. And it's like, you know, everyone can look at that and understand it. Uh, and then adding, uh, adding video just to, you know, show clips of that probably for each kind of subsection, they're probably add about two minutes to video. So it's not completely over empowering. Um, and then finally, after that is the data to kind of to add context to that. So information, how they look to play, this is what it looks like. And then this is how successful or unsuccessful they are at it. And that's pretty much done for each kind of area of the game. Um, and that's worked for me in the past. Obviously, I've kind of changed and adapted some things. Like if I was working for, you know, if I was working for a U18 team, I would kind of not dumb down because, I mean, you can argue all you want if teenagers are dumb or not. Um, but like making sure that it's not, I'm not completely throwing like, you know, half spaces at them when I'm talking about, you know, a, a group of U10 because that's just not going to fly. Um, but if I was working for, for Arsenal and I was presenting information, I'd be able to upscale that a little bit more. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. I think that brings us quite nicely on to, for a development piece, you mentioned around kind of those younger players and you worked on national teams and stuff as well. How would you get the player to, one, engage with clips um, and two, is like the development process to that? And then a two, kind of identify that in areas they need to develop. So, you know, if you're talking about an individual who's looking at game understanding of when to come inside to receive possession or when to stay wider, create space or 1v1s, um, how do you create engagement? Um, and are there any particular strategies you've used previously to allow the players to maybe watch the games more than they necessarily want to? Yeah, so that's kind of the part about I kind of touched on it about the kind of like making sure that video analysis sessions aren't just me basically talking to them the entire time. But I work with younger groups. So one thing I like to do is make it a really collaborative process. Um, so, you know, basically like turning it into like kind of like a workshop of them. And um, that might be a collective kind of group or like if I sit down with a player individually with a laptop watching clips, asking them questions, basically being like, okay, uh, like you said, for the inverted winner, basically ask them questions like, what, what do you think you did well here? What do you think you didn't do so well, et cetera, et cetera. Just so they kind of understand or asking questions. So like, I'm not just basically saying you need to do this. So they actually, players want to know why they're doing something nowadays. They don't just want to be told. So if I'm basically starting that process early, it makes it a little more collaborative uh, and a little bit less, less more intimidating for them to basically sit down and basically be in like their you know, they're getting yelled at or they're, you know, they're showing, they're showing all the negative clips. So kind of making it a collaborative process is really important, I think. And as well, kind of changing up for delivery, because like sometimes you might need a little bit more, you know, if I was working for a younger player, I would probably use less data just because that's a little bit more, um, less, um, it requires a little bit more of a translation for them. If you watch a video, it's very much like they can see it. This is what happens. Um, and that's kind of why I've always used video as a starting point because just the translation period for younger players is much, much easier. Um, and as well, I've, I've kind of made, you know, I've kind of made games out of it. If you're working for like, I've worked for 
14 year old kids, 15 year old boys, for example, um, you know, making sure like, you know, kind of turn the game to, if you want to make a slideshow and being like, this is what this player did show video clip. Okay. What option should you have picked a, B or C you can, you know, turn kind of a turn a game to it. So I think it's kind of a, a collaborative process. So it's not just so much like a, you know, them sit staring at a wall the entire time. And there's kind of countless ideas, like the best, like I said, the best analysts are the ones who are the best able to contextualize information. Um, you know, you can make it, you can watch, you can ask players to watch, you know, for example, if I was kind of like I mentioned earlier, like if I'm working with a really, really good passing center back, you know, I might say, you know, oh, did you see what Joachim Anderson did for Crystal Palace against Arsenal last week and against Liverpool? Show them clips of that and being like, okay, like we're going to work on some, some, we're going to show you some video about ways you can do this in training. And uh, so make it a little bit much more like a, like I said, uh, um, just me talking to them more of a collaborative kind of learning process. Um, and that obviously certain players will be more comfortable with it. You know, it's just naturally, you know, I've worked with 35 year old players who like video, some who hate video. It's never going to be a completely perfect thing. Uh, it's just basically making sure it's very tailored to each kind of subset of players and knowing your kind of knowing your audience, like certain players love video, certain players love data, certain players just absolutely hate it. So finding your presentation techniques, which are able to kind of suit all parties, and that might might require a little more time because you might have to pull a couple of players aside and say, "Hey, we're just gonna watch some clips, you and me," um, rather than just being able to kind of make a one size fits all thing. But that's you know that's that's learning ultimately. Like there's you know every single player is different, so. And do you see a cultural difference between the work you did in the States and over here? Because, you know, like in NFL, for example, I know there's a massive steer towards going through film. It's like kind of a pride of place of your yeah. Peyton Mannings and whatnot being in the film room at six o'clock in the morning to get yeah. game plans together and whatnot. But over here, just from my experience, it probably isn't as no. prominent and hasn't yeah. been previously. Do you see a cultural difference? And yeah how how do you work amongst that if there is one yeah um i haven't found as much of a cultural difference in terms of the video it's been the data which has been a, a lot of pushback um in the in the uh, uk compared to the us you know um well not every kid you know like we've kind of in the us you're basically kind of like thrown data for in sports through baseball nfl hockey like at a very young age so like players kind of know like even if they don't really understand what expected goals means like they kind of understand that data is a part of sports um so that kind of made it easier for when i was working with players over there is basically being like they, they they maybe didn't necessarily care about it which is another thing entirely but they knew that it was something that was going to be thrown at them meanwhile um when i was working with when i first started doing stuff with bass city I basically had to sit down with them and and like there were some players who uh for example one of our assistants now who was our goalkeeper uh ryan clark he had been playing for bristol rovers he was at oxford united a couple other clubs but like data from the start of his career was basically nowhere in, in football meanwhile now at you know close to 40 years old i think he is 40 now i'm um, sorry ryan if you're not 40 years old yet um but basically like the one thing is like he didn't have any of that kind of that kind of in, information about next gen data. Um, so basically what I had to do was like contextualize it being like, okay, this is, this is what expected goals is. And then this is what it means. This is, you know, why I'm going to be showing it to you. And then, you know, here's an example of, uh, um, of like a good XG shot and a bad XG shot. And then when you're able to kind of turn it into like actual practical football knowledge, you can make that a lot of that data translation smaller, which I, I don't think a lot of people um, within the kind of analytics space have done a great job of. Like, for example, just using the expected goals thing again, you know, it makes a lot of sense. If you're taking a shot from with, with wide of the frame of the goal uh, with four defenders in front of it and it's, it's a header, it's less of a good chance than if you're shooting within the width of the six-yard box on the ground with no goalkeeper in the net. Like it's very easy to kind of use that information in a kind of a traditional coaching sense. You just have to make sure that you're actually framing it that way rather than saying like, well, it's a, it's a model, it's a data model. Like you have to listen to it, it's right. So it's like, it's very much your presentation, presentation techniques. In terms of key stats kind of during games, et cetera, obviously yeah. we've seen something like XG kind of crop up a little bit more. 
from your perspective, are there any key signifiers of to what actually successful teams do or don't do? Or if you're looking at a game, do you see anything that is posted that's irrelevant for, for large proportions? Yeah, I think uh, obviously expected goals is kind of important just to kind of show the amount of chances you've created. But like there's, there's a lot of ones out there which are like possession statistics. I don't really care about like if it's like if we've had 70 percent of the ball but we haven't created any shots obviously that means nothing um quality of possession obviously matters because if, if we like one thing I, I talk about is like field tilt which is basically like how much of the ball we've had in their final third is important if you kind of link that up with our chance quality expected goals like that obviously shows you something so we've had the ball in the final third um and we're creating you know you've only created one shot out of it it's probably something i want to highlight at halftime um but in terms of like overall key statistics, like um, it kind of obviously kind of matters on how the kind of how, how the game is going uh, in terms of like either how we're playing as well as like the actual score line. Um, so if we basically highlighted pre-match, you know, we want to press their center backs and we've only, you know, we've looked, we have look at our pressure numbers and they're really, really low or like we're not actually turning those pressures into actual um, regains of possession. That's something that matters to me. Um, uh, obviously, like passes into the box, kind of like key performance metrics, which are kind of linked to kind of our style of play are more important because like there's there's tons of of kind of event level data, which is important in terms of like highlighting the style of play. But that's overall like kind of like, like a, a, a lump sum average. So like you look at like, I look at, for example, um, I'll use PPDA, which is pressures per uh, like passes per defensive action, basically, which kind of looks at like every time a player passes, like how many times you're actually kind of applying pressure to that. So like a lower number is really good. Like Liverpool teams like that, like Leeds have a really high or sorry, really low pressure number in that. Um, so basically those kind of numbers are a little bit lower, are difficult because they kind of don't look into the context of the game really. Um because, like, for example, like, to actually press the ball, you actually need, you know, to actually be able to press something. So if a team is getting it, they're immediately launching it. You can't press something which is not there. Um, so data, which is kind of linked to kind of, like, the kind of, like, style of play as well as the kind of the outcomes is something I really care about. So, And would you say that's kind of the role of your data analysts and whatnot now is more to find – as you mentioned there, kind of event points or action points that yeah. relate specifically to your style of play. So you say, you know, if we get the ball into this area of the pitch yeah. a certain number of times a game, we are more likely to score yeah. this number of goals. So actually you're trying to remove away from the generic ones that work for every team. And it's more yeah. like if we do this, this certain number of times, yeah. our chance of winning or scoring goes up exponentially. Yeah, exactly. And like, because pulling apart, pulling because there's 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 so many metrics that we have at Stats Bomber, like just any kind of data provider has, like you can kind of get lost in it and kind of become like completely consumed by like every single data point. Um, kind of like how I was saying with kind of like how I present you know information to players in terms of tactical information with a data analyst and what I do. Obviously, I work with data myself. It's very important to pick out kind of the relevant bits of information. Um, so. A team with presses, you know, make sure you're highlighting kind of all the pressers, uh, the, sorry, the pressure pressure data. Um, if you're a team which obviously looks to create danger from set pieces, like, you know, data points of like, well, they've given up, uh, you know, four, four chances at the back post on corners. That's obviously something we need to highlight. So kind of like linking that data in terms of to the style of play um, is really, really important because because like I said, um, you, you can get completely lost in kind of the amount of information you showed to players. And it's obviously a lot of it's not really relevant. So, And I guess moving on to, on to stats bomb and whatnot, I guess from, from my perspective, purely from the outside looking in, it seemed like, and you're probably going to hate this, Moneyball probably took the sports world a little bit by storm and inception. Some, someone was very creative and yeah. it's kind of allowed – you know, the Oakland A's to compete. And it seemed like, you know, obviously NFL tried to adopt it. I know Cleveland Browns went down that route for a period. There was talk about Daryl Morey doing it, et cetera, as well. But in a in a football perspective, where did Stats Bomb come from? What was the yeah. inception? And then what is it currently trying to do, 
you know, yeah, what 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 is his yeah. in the market? So, um, Stats Bomb was started by our CEO Ted Knudsen, uh, who's actually American as well. So, we're you can take the United States for, I guess, a lot of the the football data, which obviously makes sense coming from the data side. Uh, and it was originally started as a blog, basically, just kind of an. It, it, he was interested in analytics, started as a blog. Uh, eventually kind of came into like sort of like a consultancy, which we used opt data and kind of like made a platform for teams to access the data. Um, and now we're full on, we, we bought our own collection uh, agency uh, with about 500 people collecting data. Um, and now it's very much kind of a platform for tools. So like a, a direct competitor to Opta. So it very started off kind of like just like a blog. And now it's very much a provider. Um, basically what we do is, uh we sell data to teams obviously but like our goal is to not basically like you know we're basically to come to, to support each club's kind of like in-house analytics or like coaching kind of stuff so we're basically the data that we provide our aim is to basically help clubs either you know with recruitment or um with analysis uh etc basically make better decisions because like data is never going to be and we're not we're not trying to push like data is basically the, the end point for everything. Like, you look at the data, you sign a player, you look at the data and that's all you share. Like it has to be very much a collaborative process with the kind of the, the ongoings of like traditional football knowledge in a club. Um, but basically what we do is make sure that our data is the best, best it can be to help clubs make better decisions. Um, and you kind of look at that, like the, the, the very obvious example, our team's, like Liverpool, who had Michael Edwards and people there, like they joined the traditional thinking of Jurgen Klopp, who's obviously a fantastic coach, but wasn't so much a data guy. That's just, you know, he wasn't, that's not what his, his job is, so he doesn't necessarily have to be one. But linking the kind of to do of like Jurgen Klopp wants to play this heavy metal football, which he, he coined. We're going to join that together with our data and the people using it at Liverpool. And we're going to join together. All right, we're going to sign these players so Jurgen can do what he does. And that's basically helping them kind of make better decisions. And that obviously goes all the way down to, like I said, the recruitment and the analysis level. Um, so, And so from, from a stats bomb perspective, and obviously you're collecting this data and send it out and stuff, how do you, I guess, help guide clubs that come to you with the data that they're using? Obviously, Liverpool's a really high-profile example yeah. of, how they're going to do it and they're going to go and spend millions and millions of pounds. But if you look at a more regional one, I'm going to pluck any name out the air, but like a forest green, for example, yep. their budget's going to be greatly reduced. Probably yep. the, the the amount of players in the pool that they're going to be able to actually be able to afford, et cetera, is greatly reduced. So how do you make your, or make their stats bespoke to a club like that so that they can still have use to it, but they can still maybe identify recruiters or, play in a way that might cause teams problems or yeah. that type of stuff. So one thing I will say is like the actual, like what we collect for teams doesn't actually change in terms of quality or like what we actually show. So like the same data, if you're a forest green, it's the same data you get from Liverpool. Um, and if clubs have kind of in-house analysis structures, we don't actually say like, this is how you should use it. We basically provide them the information and they can use it to how they want. So obviously like, and you look at it like forest green, like even, you know, league two level, like a lot of the constraints will be like pl signing players from within that kind of not catchment area, because it's more of an academy term, but like basically that kind of area, because obviously league two players aren't making extraordinary amounts of money. So they can't ask a player from, I don't know, from Norfolk to kind of come over there and basically play for a team in, uh, in Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire. Um, um, so a lot of that's basically like they kind of still have to use their kind of traditional processes to to actually look at players that they want and obviously like you know use the kind of the data and analysis side that they want um we're basically making sure that um when they actually do have to use those kind of decisions based on the data it's actually you know something that they can trust in terms of that but when they go back and lean now on their, their normal processes they're the same it's obviously slightly different when teams approach it approach us with a consulting job because that's basically us they're asking for our opinion on stuff and that's when we can be a bit more uh, use our data uh, to be a little bit more um suggestive in terms of like you should sign this player so and in terms of you guys being able to identify trends that might be emerging or potentially on their way out 
Um, how do you go around identifying that? So obviously we used the inverted fullback as an example yeah. previously. Um, you're also, I know you're going to have maybe goalkeepers going from being six foot four to six foot yeah. two or yeah. you know, 20 years ago, it was about saving shots. Now they need to be just as good with their feet as they are with their hands. So how do you go around maybe identifying trends that are on their way in, into mainstream football? Yeah, so the trends like that, which are a little bit more like, not not niche in terms, but like kind of harder to identify in terms of 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 like in just in terms of pure kind of data, are a little bit harder, and that's kind of where someone like my role kind of comes into it. So if they're seeing trends of players like fullbacks, for example, making a lot of passes more in central areas, uh, they'll kind of go to me and basically be like, "Why is this the case? Why is there such a huge jump in?" in this kind of thing. And I'll basically kind of provide a, a tactical report on that. Um, but as well, you can, we have, we, we have data collected uh, from, you know, from, you know, 10 plus years ago, more than that. Um, so for, like for, for example, like one big thing we've seen in kind of a trend is the lack of, you know, either just in terms of the number of crosses going into the box in wide areas or as well, who's making that cross. Cause obviously a lot of the time it was, it was just a left winger who would go run down the touchline and cross it. Now it's like a fullback or, you know, you know, whoever it is making those kind of passes, like even, you know, you, you've seen the kind of the influence that, uh, that Andy Robertson and, and Trent Alexander Arnold have in terms of just being a creative force now, which is something you'd never see, you know, in, you know, 2010, for example. Um, so we kind of, we, we were always making sure that we're kind of caught up on those kind of looking at those trends in terms of what's going on. Um, and as well, we don't actually change how we collect things. Like we're not going to suddenly turn into like, just like looking at completely different data because, um, it obviously is like something that will become in vogue. Like we're not going to start collecting like inverted fullback data. It's just like, we're kind of, we're always aware of like, what's, what's kind of in vogue. And it's obviously like, that might kind of change how we, 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 um, I'm not on the marketing side, but like how we market our data and like what we actually are able to show people. Like, so um, set pieces has always been a huge part of, of, of stats bombs kind of, kind of journey. And that's, we've, we've made a big, we've had free kick court, uh, free kick and corner courses that have been implemented and, and taken on by coaches. And like, we saw that once we started talking about set pieces and I think it was Denmark uh, with Ted's work at uh, FC Michelin, like the entire league went crazy for set piece goals, like the, the huge jump in terms of that. So it's kind of funny that like the data obviously like is kind of shows what has happened tactically, but it's also helped kind of shape tactics in a way. So. Yeah, I, th I think it's a really interesting one. I guess that um, I read a little bit, I read some books around this space from a number of years ago and I think in one of the books they tried to make an argument that Darren Bent was more valuable to a team than Thierry Henry because of the level of goals that he was able to support and I would have loved that to have been the case as a Spurs fan but I don't think that was necessarily just no I think I think I think I think Harry Rudnap would disagree with that one too uh so yeah but no I think it's a really interesting piece I guess that my, my next question comes around the how do you go around challenging conceptions or knowns that maybe don't align to what you're seeing in, in the data? So um, I, and I don't know if this is one, for example, but my perception was I'd always struggle more defending in swinging corners or in yeah. swinging free kicks. Whereas I see now a lot of outswingers, which would suggest yeah. to me, maybe statistically it says outswingers, you score more than you do in swingers. So, if, yeah. if that's not the case, please tell me. But how do you go around challenging maybe what are industry knowns? I'm going to put that in inverted commas yeah. or industry thoughts by you going, actually, have you thought about this? Because the data doesn't actually stack up to what you're saying. Yeah. And that kind of just using that kind of corner example, I think I'm not 100% accurate with this, but I think that outswing corners create uh, end in more shots, not necessarily more goals. Um, so that might, it's kind of a, kind of a line of thinking there, but like a lot of that is like, there's a lot of kind of traditional thinking in terms of like, you know, like just penalty techniques in terms of like go for power or do you, you know, look, wait for the goalkeeper. And, and those are all relatively easy to kind of pull out from a data standpoint. You just look at the outcome of every, and every single event we have is basically tagged in terms of that. So like, if I was using that corner example, I would just look at 
uh, inswinging corners, what percentage of those led to shots and compared to outswingers. Um, and those kind of help us. So we, we don't, we don't really necessarily go on like, uh, um, audits in terms of like, oh, I saw this question in, um, on Twitter. Let's see if that actually makes sense. Um, but we do that. We do do that occasionally with certain things like for, um, I know FIFA does this where they put out like a report where it's like post-match or like, um, post world cups or euros that kind of look at like 27% of goals are from set pieces. So we'll kind of look at that and be like, okay, well, that's interesting. Let's look at our data and say, like, what kind of set piece goals were they? Um, how many defenders were in the box from these from these set pieces? What kind of delivery were they? What teams were doing it really well? And we can identify trends that way and kind of see what, what is important to coaches. So when we're actually collecting data, we're actually saying, like, okay, well, this is obviously important to coaches. Like, coaches really, really care about set pieces. So let's start highlighting our set piece data. And in terms of making anything you're producing visually appealing, it's, it sounds silly, but I guess yeah. part of the consumption oh, it's important. Is, it's very important. Yeah. Com- consumption is it being aesthetically pleasing for someone to pick up and go, actually, I understand it, or it's nice to look at. How would you go around ensuring that the data you're providing is one, digestible for whoever's looking yeah. at it, and then two, appealing to that player, that coach, that audience? Yeah. So our, our main platform is called Stats 12 IQ, and it's basically like, an interactive kind of dashboard thing uh, where it's very much like you look at a shot map, you see the, you see the 18 yard box or the, or that, that half of the pitch and you see a shot there, you click on it. It has the information on the shot, it has a freeze frame. You look at pressures, you look at a, 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 a pitch map and it will show pressures of like the high, the high frequency high heat maps. Um, you want to look at, I want to look at every single passes that, uh, Tiago, um, Tiago made in this last match. You go into, you look at that, you see all the passes. So making sure that it's not like just like when you click on that. Like we obviously provide this information because there's ways that analysts can take the data and create their own bespoke visualizations. Um, but making sure that we provide data, it's not just looking at a bar chart. It's making sure that it's something that you look at and be like, oh, well, that makes sense to me. That in in a football context, um, and that's very important. And um, we're actually looking to add video to kind of thing. So you click on a shot map and you say, oh, this is the shot. And you see a video clip of that. Just so you know what you're kind of looking at. Um, so ways to make it so like, just to use another example, if I worked with, with Bass City and I was looking at our pressures and being like, I show a bar chart, but then I show a heat map of this is where we're winning our pressures. You could, a coach will be able to relate to that very, very much so. Yeah, I think that interactive piece is really interesting. I said some of the, I remember doing a little bit of work with Southampton and being able to show the boys actually where their uh, shots were from in the 18 yard yeah. box. And then I asked them to do a bit of an interactive thing of where they thought their shots ended up on the goal. Yeah. And they were putting X's and O's everywhere. And yeah. then I showed them and it was pretty much if you had an outline of a goalkeeper, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Richie, all of them were yeah. there. And they kind yeah. of looked at me and were like, so we just aim at the goalkeeper. I was like, well, yeah, basically. So yeah. that uh, was a really nice visualization for them. That Actually, it didn't really matter where they were in the box. All of them went in that area. So that's yeah. an area exactly. for improvement. But I think, like you said, that interactive piece is really, really important. Yeah. And making making sure it's customizable customizable as well because we have countless clients who play very different countless styles of play and like while we have to make it somewhat kind of you know we can't we can't change every single version of our platform to suit everybody like making sure that there's enough tools in there that within how you want to play and what you care about you can look at that so it's not like completely not putting you completely in a box. So. And let let's move this forward. So if I was to say to you in in the football world grade a use of statistics or video etc what point will we get to where you would say actually this is the optimum optimal use of this type of work that's being done sorry can you repeat that sorry so if 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 i said to you now in five years time we're going to be at the optimal of Ooh. using stats and video and stuff what does that look like what is the best example you could see of uh, integration of an mdt team or <laughs> day to et cetera, what would that look like? Yeah. Um, I think that we're moving kind of closer to that because you just look at the kind of people who are getting hired by clubs. Like they have a background in coaching. They have a background 
in you know they they don't they might not necessarily be able to like use programming languages as to do stuff but they actually look at data and they they see how it makes sense so it's kind of like a perfect symbiotic relationship where like it's a very much like uh a get like a yin and a yang sort of scenario of an equal not not, not necessarily an equal blend because i still think I, th I still think the kind of the coaching and uh, traditional analysis side still should kind of trump the data but making sure that no piece of information you deliver uh from coaching video is without context so without data tied to that and i think it's kind of the perfect symbiotic relationship like obviously like certain clubs will might not be that because like data quality is obviously hard if you're working for you know like an amateur club compared to uh, a kind of a top level club but like a top level football i think that most decisions now are they're powered by data, but they're not necessarily always led by data because like just looking at the data from a starting point can be um, without kind of any context of how you're playing can be not as effective. Perfect. So listen, I appreciate we're close to the time that we allotted for this. So last question for me, which is who's the most impressive individual that you've worked with in this space and why? Um, in terms of just analysis or just like any kind of uh, kind of so the, it can be either the analysis side or the use of data side. So if there's a coach that you've worked with, you think actually he's really ahead of his time and the way he uses the data or is closer to yeah. that. So I, I think um, I think probably uh, James York at StatsBomb, who's actually my kind of like direct superior, is, is kind of like my my mentor and kind of side of things. Because while I use data in the past, um, obviously with kind of like, the side of things he's really since i joined stats bomb has been a really big driver and kind of like helped me understand data at more of a of a deeper level but he also he also has that kind of background in terms of like understanding what is relevant to coaches and i think he's very measured with a lot of his opinions like he's not while he's obviously you know he's like our his role title is director of football at stats bomb um so while he's obviously very much on the data side of things he understands the limitations of data in certain areas in ways to improve that. And um, he works on our IQ platform, which I was kind of talking about is our visualization kind of dashboard. And he's been really, really receptive to a lot of my ideas and clients ideas about, you know, ways to make it a little bit less more, um, less more of a kind of like a, a stumbling block in terms of like what is relevant. So I would say James York. Perfect. This is kind of really appreciate your time. I think a really good info, well, really good podcast into how statistics and analysts to use and, you know, what that might look like in the future and, and whatnot. So yeah, really appreciate your time and hopefully we can organize a coffee at some point soon. We can go around Bath and have, have a catch up. Definitely. I'd love to. Thanks for having me on. It's been, it's, uh, it's been a great, great time. Perfect. Thanks very much. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.